This week on Arizona Illustrated, speaking up against anti-Asian hate and violence in America. If they would go out and see the lives through other people's eyes, then I think they will understand we are not so different after all. A first of its kind exhibition at the Tucson Museum of Art. The energy in this exhibition is just palpable. New ways of seeing in the future. I'm personally very interested in developing this place to help people. And a Lebanese love song. Welcome to Arizona Illustrated. I'm Tom McNamara. Thank you for joining us for our first episode of the new season. It's good to be back with you. You know, since the start of the pandemic, there's been an alarming surge in violent attacks against AAPI communities. The violence has been linked to public rhetoric blaming Asian Americans for the spread of COVID-19. And while the number of reported attacks has risen dramatically, women account for 65% of the reported cases. Here in Tucson, we spoke with two leaders of the Asian American community about how their friends and loved ones are coping with and responding to potential threats. We are here standing together because we are sad, we are angry, and we are exhausted by the roller coaster ride of emotions that we've all been dealing with today. Many years ago, we chose to come here, not just to pursue the education, but also to pursue my freedom. And this country used to be the country all people look up. The humanity value, all people are equal. Doesn't matter the skin color, it doesn't matter where you're from. That's a value we believe too. I never feel afraid, feared of anything. I feel equal like everybody else. But all of a sudden it was like, why does the racial thing become such a big concern for the whole country? Why we're being targeted and we're being to, uh, to be attacked, to be pointed finger to? so much, the terrible attacks uh, to the elderly and women, especially in San Francisco and New York. People worry, they say, if something threat to your life and to your parents, your sister, brothers, should we call out for help? I saw those discussions and concerns, and I said, maybe we should reach out. We sit down with uh, Tucson PD, and we invited some politician and then uh, from different departments to listen to our concern, to listen to the community's uh, questions. What is the legal grounds to defend myself or my loved ones with a legally owned firearm? I am not interested in buying a weapon, but I, I do fear for my life right now. The treatment towards Asian American Pacific Islanders is uncalled for. It's unjustified. It should be denounced. I'm wondering if there's, there are educational efforts out there um, to help make that happen and to bring greater awareness and visibility to the Asian American community. A lot of the times people say, ah, those Asian groups, you know, they would not complain. They would not, you know, uh, they're the silent majority. And, and I think those times have passed. We have to first start to 
understand what the term Asian American means. You know, when they say AAPI, what does that mean? That means everybody who, you know, have heritage from the Asian Pacific region. And that involves more than, you know, 40 plus countries, if not more. Some of them were natives. They were born here in the United States. So I, I guess people have to understand the group itself, what it means, and then talk about the contribution. Chinese American have been here since the 1800s. Korean American have been here probably since the you know, 50s and the 60s as well. So they need to understand, yes, you know, this virus came from China, but you know, it could have came from Africa, it could have came from England. Would you discriminate against you know, anybody from England if it started in England first? Chinese labor do the humongous contribution to the transcontinental railroad. From the, the west to the east side, it used to take six months to seven months. After the railroad built, seven days. That make this country jump to a totally different stage. This history was not being put in the education part. So a lot of people don't know. They think Chinese come here to take things away. But we're not, we're generations here. We made our contributions, including Indian, Korean, Japanese people that involved in the technology, science, entertainment, and they all made the contributions to this country. So I think all the ethnic groups do something, do their share. Being an immigrant myself, I think every time I, I think about the opportunity that was given to me by my parent to go to school here, to make a living here, um, it's extraordinary. Just like all the friends and, and families and everybody that I know, a lot of them were born and raised here in the United States. A lot of them were very grateful. But I also have a lot of people that don't understand what they have. And they don't understand why so many people want to come here legally or otherwise. Um, it's because they don't have what we have here. So if they would go out and see the lives through other people's eyes, then I think they will understand we are not so different after all. In my communities, I hope they will stand up for whatever the problem they encounter, uh, any bias or any discrimination. You know, when something like pandemic happened, what I understand is people, us, all the people live in this country, in this land, should work with each other, help each other to get over this. Because from time to time, there's pandemic, but pointing to each other doesn't help, doesn't resolve the problem. Helping each other will. United will make us more powerful and stronger. I wish everybody health and stay well throughout this next however many months. And when we can get together safely again, I invite everybody to come back to the Chinese Cultural Center to visit so that we can share our stories and get back together and go back on the road to normalcy. As Dr. Martin Luther King stated so eloquently, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate, only love can do that. We must participate actively in the dialogues that create the light to overcome racism and support healing in our communities. One way to learn more about the Asian American community is to visit the Chinese Cultural Center in Tucson, where they offer classes, programs, and events for all ages. To find out more, go to tucsonchinese.org. A first-of-its-kind exhibition is showing at the Tucson Museum of Art. Four solo artists from Southern Arizona, selected by four TMA curators, making up one powerful and diverse showcase with work that's focused on personal identity, politics, and the social issues of our time. This is 4x4. Four four.
My name is Willie Bonner, and I'm an American artist. A lot of people like to associate me as a black artist. Uh, black is my culture, but I am American. When you walk into this exhibition, I think the first thing that, that I see is an explosion of color. The energy in this exhibition is just palpable. I find the work positive, colorful, exuberant, and joyous. Oh, yeah? Oh. Willie and I have known each other for actually many years, but in 2000, he was finishing up his master's degree at the University of Arizona, and um, I was working as a curator there. So uh, I mounted an exhibition of uh, his work. She was such a breath of fresh air in how she received me as an artist and my work. And it was the type of person that I always dreamt of meeting in my journey as being an artist. We got reconnected through uh, his inclusion in the biennial. And I said, you know, I need to see your new work. This is wonderful what you're doing. And paid a studio visit and was wowed. And then brought our CEO, Jeremy Michalazak, down to see the work. And that was actually the inspiration for 4x4. I didn't choose art, art chose me. Art would always bring me back to recording what I feel, what I experience daily and it was something that I couldn't shake. The bittersweet thing is that I see everybody as a human being. The systemic racism is kind of like divide us from our humanity. So when you look at some of these pieces here, there are portholes that are left open. So if you look at the whole canvas, you'll start seeing that you can go not just at the surface, but the layers under it, you know? So it's taking you into a deeper thought when I'm painting, I'm just gauging the sensibility of being human. It's on the person that look at the work to choose where they stand. I was hiking last week and I realized that I'm only looking down because I'm more worried about the crawling things <laughs> that, my, that coexist with us in the desert, you know? That, and I realized that, oh, that, that's very interesting because in the studio I've been also looking down a lot. The work comes from my experience living here as an Iranian American living on the borderland and having to deal with everything that comes with this particular place, it's geography, it's politics, it's ecology, like all of, the, all of these things are very important to me. For me as a curator, I'm always interested in artists that are sort of working in between things. And I think with Naza Farin's work, it's really about the negative space. When a viewer walks in, they may not necessarily understand what's in front of them. However, there's this sort of sense of discovery that they have to try to figure this out. I was born and raised in Iran, and I finished my undergraduate at the University of Tehran. Then I moved to Chicago for graduate school. My work changed a lot since I moved here, and I work very slow. Since I have spent more time in the natural world, I think there has been a natural interest into learning more about the landscape and learning more about the history of this place and finding my place in that. And the work you see here really comes from that research, looking at the earth, looking at the geological formations. Well, it was like to work together. I don't know. <laughs> uh, so J Jeremy was very easy. Whatever I said, he said yes. So I, that's great. The role of the curator is really to seek out the unique, the sort of, the things that are coming forward, sort of the, the trends and the nuances that sort of happen. He said that, oh, like maybe it can be just a photograph and the sculptures. And that really like helped me to like ease my anxiety of like filling up this space, which can be a very large space, but that was not my intention. The way that you enter the space, we actually specifically moved a wall in front to really force viewers to walk through the space in a specific manner. The whole installation is meant to be walked around, investigated. I heard from my mother, which translates to you have a cactus on your forehead. My mom was critical of that. like. You're trying to Americanize yourself, and you're obviously assimilating, but you're kind of forgetting where you came from. 
the work definitely responds to that and that inner struggle that I definitely have and many other people do. I actually first met Alex around three years ago. Uh, we were both living in Texas's Rio Grande Valley and we were both on the faculty at a university there. I moved here literally a year after Christopher arrived and uh, I knew that he had, he had a job as a curator somewhere, but I couldn't remember that it was exactly in at the Tucson Museum of Art. Then when we had this idea of doing this show of four Tucson artists, I thought this was just kind of a perfect moment to highlight someone who had a lot to say about living in the borderlands. Everything just fell into place and, and I was really excited to participate in basically my Tucson debut. Alex and I kind of come from the same place. My mom is Mexican, I grew up speaking some Spanish, so the phrases that we see here, the kind of ideas, I felt like I could, they're yours, but I felt like I could follow you and see where you were going. I just want to add, it was definitely a collaborative <laughs> effort and he was straightforward with me, which I loved. So across a lot of the works, you'll see this like literal division and the division itself acts as a metaphor for the division between uh, South Texas and Mexico. At the same time, I'm critical of assimilation and the process of it. And it almost seems like an erasure of history and, and culture and this very traditional Mexican background. But at the same time, I'm also celebrating both sides. I think as human beings, we all experience something so similar. Like we speak different languages, but we all trying to convey the same thing. The medium that I use in my work kind of spanning from photography to video performance and installation. And the focus of my work is about the experience of being immigrants in connection to home tradition country, like personal politics and cultural differences. I actually knew Antwi before I knew she was an artist. We were both working as students at the Center for Creative Photography, so she was getting her undergraduate degree in photography, and I was getting my master's in art history. So which just, is, what's first? So this one and that one should just switch. Switch, okay. And the body of work that's on view here, I've been involved with since the beginning through conversations and kind of talking about locations and issues she's dealing with. A lot of these work on view right now, they are work that being created within the last 10 years. It's presented in a really poetic way, right? Like it is not overt, not specific enough in locations that I think people can find this access point to be related to. I love that fact of push and pull between material. But that's what the whole series is about. Yeah, it is, like emotionally being pushed and pulled away. All of those experiences we have in life, regardless of the geography where we come from and how different we are, it's all very similar to each other. Visual, art, creative writing, all of the art form and even like the right conversations, be able to activate that sense of mutual emotions. It's really important that we see that visual artists, painters, sculptors can really lead the way in this conversation, helping us to figure out who are we and what are we doing here and how do we relate to this place. It's one of the things that I really love about Tucson and that it's this place where people are coming up with answers to this question. It is a privilege to work with artists. It's an absolute privilege. And for myself as a director of an institution, not necessarily my full-time role as not a curator, to have the space and ability to do this is really going back to what I love about museums. This just goes to show how diverse this region really is and really the amazing professional artists that are living and working here. To learn more about the artist and their work, visit TucsonMuseumOfArt.org. This is the University of Arizona's Wyant College of Optical Sciences. A team led by UA professor Hong Hua is currently busy developing the next generation of wearable display systems for virtual and augmented reality technologies. These new systems promise to enhance both what we see and how we see it. Thirty years ago, when I was in the first year of my college, 
My initial fascination was to develop telescope systems and look in outer space. And then when I saw this article talking about the virtual reality technology that can put you into another space digitally, the imagination attracted me. My name is Hong Hua, and I'm a professor at the Wyand College of Optical Science at the University of Arizona. My work here is mainly working on optical technologies for uh, enabling advanced variable displays for virtual reality and augmented reality. So virtual reality, you can think of it as a technology that put the user completely immersed into a, a computer-generated environment versus augmented reality, or nowadays people like to call it mixed reality, is trying to insert the digital contents or the digital avatar or digital objects into physical reality so that you have this harmony between your digital world and, uh, and physical reality. That's one of the first variable life field display system that we developed a few years ago. But one of the major things that we, we are working on is trying to, how can we shrink it down the volume? Every time there is a new macro display technology coming up, or there is another component, I would take that opportunity to develop a, a new system. In the last few years, I'm leading a group of graduate students working on optical technology that can potentially address the most challenging problem exists in VR or AR display systems. One of the challenges is to render contents that give the user ability to focus at a different distance because in real life, your eye is able to focus far away or look at something really close. So one of the approach is to be able to create a stack of focal planes dynamically, either time sequentially or spatially, so that you are able to render 3D volume in a range that from very close to very far away and we are trying to render geometrically the light field or the light directions that um, presumably coming from the 3D objects. So this device actually had a, uh, we call it an integrated imaging unit, giving you the ability for your eye to be able to see the 3D objects rendered by the display appear to or behave in similar ways as your real world physical objects. Some of the particular areas of applications that I'm personally very interested in is developing displays to help people. And one particular project that I have worked recently was the work with eSight. eSight is a Canadian company that they develop a variable assistive technology for people who have compromised vision that are not able to see their surroundings with their naked eyes, but they have some residual vision. When you put this device on, you would be looking through the camera and look at your real world through the camera. And then I, if I look at your face, now your face will be a few times bigger than what I would normally be able to see with my naked eye. <laughs> Some other application areas that we had worked on in the past was to develop a anatomy visualizer for doctors to be able to show their patients how the surgical procedure is gonna be. So to me, my motivation of helping people kind of probably coming from my family value. I grew up in a family where my father passed away at a very early age and my mom was an elementary school teacher. So you can imagine she does not make a lot of money. But however, one of the things that she had taught me was education can change your life. When you have education, you need to learn to give it back. It doesn't matter where you come from. Other people cannot tell you what you can do or what you cannot do. Only yourself can.
Like what you see on Arizona Illustrated? Visit our webpage at azpm.org to watch and share stories from this and previous episodes. And like us on Facebook, where you can watch stories, comment, and share your own story ideas. You can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram, where we share photos and links about the show and what's happening in our community. Now we bring you a performance by Tucson violinist Fatty Iskandar playing a Lebanese love song at Sweetwater Wetlands on Tucson's north side. Thanks for joining us on this first episode of the new season. Here's a look at a story for next week's show. It's funny, it wasn't until the pandemic that we started doing gigs together. Playing for a couple of songs, so much fun, but when you really get locked into it for hours, different things happen. We've worked out a way of playing it's kind of like telepathic thing. You know what they're going to do on a dime. I'm Tom McNamara. See you next week.